So Balance of Power, obviously, is the big public demo. Yep. You launched off on this with the idea of dreaming big and so on, and obviously it is a very big, uh, ambitious, audacious dream. Um, do you ever question it? Do you ever wonder if it's actually going to work in the end? And It's very complicated. Yeah. Almost Baroque. I'll tell you, the, the problem with this is I have invested my entire life into this. I mean, we've, we've bet the farm on it, literally. If this fails commercially, we will be financially ruined. You mean you and your spouse? Yep, yep. And it's not something that I can permit to fail. If this fails, my life is a failure. And that's really scary. Right, right. Um, especially because right now it's, it's very close. This thing could just be a complete disaster. So, how about some dinner? Yes, let's go get some dinner. I'm getting hungry. Back in 1992, you were sort of seeing where, the, where it was going and complaining about it. And the fact that it, wow, did it ever fulfill that, your vision, your negative dystopian vision, or whatever you want to call it, of what, what you were envisioning back then. You were complaining about the focus on graphics and so on. Yeah. I mean, I am not going to sit here and say that when Wolfenstein came out, I was not incredibly impressed and enthralled by it. I mean, I, I certainly oh, I was. I played it too. I mean, it certainly captured my imagination. When someone described it to me, even as it, like you can think of it as a piece of concept art, there's this game. It's called Wolfenstein, where you look through your own eyes down these mazes, and you can actually turn your head smoothly and walk forward and backwards smoothly. Yeah. I said no. This three-dimensional space was like blooming in front of my eyes, and I couldn't yeah. believe it. it looked so real. Yep. Like I was gonna fall into it. Yeah. You know, so I I, I understand. I, I felt much the same. <laughs> I mean, it was terribly impressive, <laughs> and Doom was the one that really, really sealed it. Wolfenstein still had a very cartoony look. Right. Actually, I've long felt that what really made Doom go was not so much the graphics as the sound. All right. So that's the, that's the interesting thing, is that, you know, even you were impressed by these kinds of things oh, yeah. and so on. And, and so, I mean, it did feel like like this little kind of revolution or something. Yeah, it just it, it just seems like everything just piled on on top of that, and we never looked back. <laughs> you know, it's just this big sandwich of, you know, progress on that one little narrow branch. For me, the, the thing I always hammer away at is it's the interaction. The entertainment lies in the interaction, not in the presentation. And right, right. So you have to design it from the ground up so that the interaction is intrinsically entertaining. Right. And I think there was some point you made in one of your books. I think you might have even been talking about Doom, where there's these this sort of graphical sugar, like that you that you sprinkled about, like when you shoot a monster, there's like a bloody thing on the floor afterward yeah, yeah. but that it has no gameplay effect it's just it's just um like a decal yeah with nothing underneath it then you you made the point that hey if it's there and you see it it should be there for an interactive reason it's a non-interactive element it's and that's a mistake because you walk over it and nothing happens yeah you don't slip on it you don't trip on it yeah you said if yeah. there's gonna be a pool of blood you better be able to slip on it yes <laughs> yes
people sort of perceive you as this grumpy old guy who just hates the game industry. <laughs> I think a lot of people, when I started telling people that Chris Crawford was coming around the Game Developers Conference, and when I was telling some of my friends what I was going to be doing on Tuesday night, a lot of them were sort of like, what's he going to do? <laughs> He's bringing his gun. I guess it doesn't seem to me like you're as, as grumpy about the game industry as I perceived you, or ahead of time was thinking that you were. Or... I think... I mean, obviously I it's going reason, in a direction that lots of us disagree with. You know? I, mean, <laughs> I think there, there are a couple of reasons why that perception exists. One, I am very dismissive of the pure techie approach to game design. I, I've said a lot of ferocious things about people who go in, all they want to do is just fuck around with a computer and make it do cute, clever things. And that is not game design. But there are a lot of people who have done that. Um, they come up with some clever graphics trick and then say, how can we turn this into a game? Right. Game, game developers are very defensive about the sordid reputation that they have. Why do you think they have that reputation? There are several reasons. One reason is that games should form character and build your body and, right, and right. so forth. Uh, or at least they should be mentally, you know, like, like chess. That's a respectable game. And video games don't have any of those traits. So they're just fun and nothing else. And there is a, a puritanical streak in American culture that feels that fun without any redeeming value is sordid. Right. But there's actually, I think... So good, clean fun is an oxymoron, right? <laughs> good, American... clean fun has to have something that makes it clean. Uh, right, right. Not just know, fun, it has to be clean fun. Yeah, but there's a second factor, I think, that is... Uh, less appreciated and that I think is actually more important and that's the glassy-eyed stare that is Johnny's playing the video game and you know I'm not sure what the current terminology is back in the in the 80s we said getting into the groove yeah, he's in the, the zone game. in the zone yes that's that's yes and the glassy-eyed stare is very frightening to the parents and the parents don't quite know why, but they look at me and say, this is wrong. The reason, the real reason why it scares people is because the, the state of consciousness that is attained when you're in the zone is basically analogous or even closer to that, maybe similar to uh, the state of mind achieved by certain mind-altering drugs. Right. Uh, we use a lot of these drugs as a way of shutting down consciousness because our conscious awareness is too painful. Right. And so we go into the drugs and basically the, the neocortex just gets cut out of the loop. Right. Well, that's exactly what happens when you go into the zone. You bypass the uh, cerebral processing. You're not consciously thinking about how to right. react. Because you couldn't play well if you did that. Right. It's, it's dropped down to a lower uh, level of processing, almost subconscious. And so basically you drop into this, into the glassy-eyed stare, where there's enormous amounts of, of mental activity going on, none of it conscious. <laughs> and but is there something, these are all based on these reflex video games. That's yes. not really present in a, in a turn-based strategy game, right? Right, right. But the ones that scare parents are the ones where the kid drops into the glassy-eyed stare. Which is what was present in all those early, people's early encounters with video games in the arcades. They yep. were 100% games like that. Game designers are acutely aware of this, and they're very defensive about it. And that's why they love to wrap themselves in the robes of art.